so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say that my introduction to the politics community on Twitch was was kind of christened by you. Awesome, if you believe me. Tell me about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was just browsing Twitch one day looking for like gaming streams. And by the way, I'm in law school. So I saw a channel that said lawyer, pro Trump, anti global warming or something. Nice. And it piqued my interest enough to to, well, to come watch. And yeah, I'm glad I'm glad. And you know, I was actually I was actually the the very first streamer ever on Twitch to, to, to focus on politics and, mm -hmm. you know, destiny, destiny had been talking about politics a lot longer than me, but destiny was always a gamer first. Right. Um, I started streaming in like 2015. Um, and with the primary focus on politics, um, and sort of gaming almost second. And so, um, uh, I, I honestly kind of am like, I kind of proudly proclaim that I was like literally the, the one first of the, the first politics streamers on Twitch. Well, like your heads up, it turns out or it seems as though like my volume is really loud and you're getting some requests to turn me down. I turned you down. Thank you. Okay, cool. No problem. Um, I mean, that's, does that feel, do you feel like the community and the politics, either the specific category has grown a lot since oh, you're dude, it's massive. Oh, that's the, yeah. yeah. I mean, dude, when I first started doing politics, most mm -hmm. most Twitch streamers actually banned politics. You could not chat yeah. about politics in, <laughs> in Twitch streams. I mean, I remember I remember specifically like watching Twitch in like 2015, um, 2014, 2015, and almost every Twitch stream like literally banned politics. Yeah, and you, you still see it on a lot of channels, like no talking about politics or no bringing up religion. And I know those are two things that are very central to your channel and your community. Right. And so when I when I started yeah. it, I was like, man, like everybody. Ban and actually, if you look at my Twitch profile, my Twitch bio, the yeah. one that I wrote in like 2014, 2015, it actually <laughs> talks about how, like, you know, most most Twitch streamers ban politics. But on my, on my channel, it's welcomed and stuff. So, you know, I well, was really that, like blazing. Yeah. I was really blazing a new trail back in 2014 and 2015, actually encouraging politics. Yeah, that's and, and I, th I think it's a great thing. And now you're seeing a lot of opportunity for other people to sort of uh oh, to, to rise it's from that and, so and much talk, i i yeah. think it's just going to continue to grow I, I feel like i feel like i got in at the like like getting into the right apple. time like it's yeah. like buying apple stock in the 80s well i feel like now you're the kind of the resident conservative to come like um and i, and I don't mean this uh to be disparaging to other conservatives on this platform but i feel like on these panels whenever you frequent there um the ones that you do frequent the caliber of argument has to be ready for really you and like, and maybe Rob Noir, right? Cause he, right, cause did. you two can kind of um, you're good with words and you can follow the logical train of an argument, um, which a lot of, I feel like some of the other conservatives maybe lack that strength. So I really feel like you're um, um, how to say this. You, you have to be ready to discuss arguments with, with debaters of your quality, um, yeah. which is also one of the reasons I, I appreciate you know, watching when I can your, your stream. Well, Though I, we have, I mean, I appreciate it. I've, yeah. I've been, I've spent, you know, I've spent literally like the last 15 years of my life studying politics. So yeah. I, sh I should, I should be able to talk about it since I've, sp I've spent 15 years studying it. Uh, so you seem like a very smart guy. And I was wondering if I could, uh, I'm just have some questions for you. Um, what are, what are things that you see in this space? that bother you sort of the most above and beyond the merits of any like given discussion. What about the conversations that are happening on Twitch? Do you find distasteful? Uh, I, I probably think the biggest one is the lack of um, support and respect for free and open thought and free and mm -hmm. open debate. Um, I mean, honestly, like uh, this is one of the worst times, if not the worst time in American history for freedom of speech. And like, forget even freedom of speech. I'm talking about even freedom of thought. Like a lot mm -hmm. of, a lot of what you see on the left and stuff is they, they support the censorship. They support banning you if they dis if, if you say something they disagree with, or if they, if you say something that they really disagree with, then they actually, they will actually, like many people actually support deplatforming they support the cancel culture um they want people banned they don't think you know uh you know i've been i go on some streams and then 
the the streamers that have me on will be attacked mm -hmm. by their own community for even platforming having me. you and so I, I and i i think you know the first amendment is you know and and the first amendment is a lot bigger than just a narrow legal principle the the first amendment is, you know is the spearhead of sort of a, a larger society underlying societal value and cultural yeah. value and like um, free and open debate and free and open thought is a fundamental fundamental aspect of a free society and it's and it's really gone by the wayside um, and so that's I think that's a very 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 disturbing aspect of of what we have going on do you feel kind of disgruntled when people try to uh, bring up arguments that uh, focus on First Amendment precedent and say things like, well, clear and present danger, well, this and that standard. Do you think they're missing the point with respect to what the First Amendment means to a certain extent? Or um, are, you, are you not happy? So when you criticize, yes, for it instance, it bugs me yeah, so much. It bugs me so much, which is why I, I, I always say, like, if you if you think of the First Amendment as nothing more than just the narrowest, narrowest uh, application of a, of a legal principle and mm -hmm. it only applies to government action and there's a, all these different exceptions to it. That's missing the point. It, the, it's, a, it's much bigger than that. It's, it's a, I understand the First Amendment. I understand the law around it. I understand the Supreme Court precedent around it. But um, it's representative of and sort of symbolic of you know, a larger sort of cultural and societal respect for for free and open speech. And so when I talk about free speech, when I talk about free speech, I'm not talking about a very narrow legal principle that only mm -hmm. applies to government action. I'm talking about free speech as the a larger concept and something that's fundamental to a free society, which we've lost sort of culturally and um, it's very disturbing. I mean, because once you once you get yeah. a, a big chunk of the population that actually does not support free speech, I mean, and, and we have a huge chunk of the population um, that actually openly and, and explicitly does not support the, the concept of free speech. And that is extremely dangerous. Yeah, I um, I'll let you know that in, in college, I'm pretty big liberal left wing, and I was disturbed a lot by what I saw in some of my sort of liberal arts, quote unquote, elite liberal art institutions, where they were like banning speakers and kind of moving away from what I saw as like the vaulted uh, need and um, of the like the First Amendment principles and free speech in general. So I, I can agree with you on, on that. I guess I just uh, I'm not sure why. I think you have these kind of profound criticisms, um, but they don't seem to be calibrated well with respect to Trump. And that's, I, I guess, one of my concerns with um, your analysis often is that, you know, you make good points, you pointed criticisms about first uh, free speech and other things, but uh, it seems like, in my opinion, you might have a blind spot for Trump. Do you feel like that is the case or do you think that you will have consistent principles that you do apply to Trump? I, I absolutely have consistent principles that I apply to Trump. I've criticized Trump all the time. Um, mm -hmm. I, in, in fact, I was never, I'm not even like, people think that I'm some like massive, like Trump, like lunatic Trump supporter. And it's like, I wasn't even, I didn't even support Trump in the 2016 primary. Oh, that's it's interesting. Like, Who did you? I fly, Ted Cruz, <laughs> Ted, Ted Cruz. Cruz. I fly, I fly a Donald Trump flag, a Trump 2020 flag, and I support Donald Trump, but that's. And I absolutely I voted for Trump in 2016 in the general election and I voted for Trump in 2020 and I support Trump and everything. But that's because um, that's just the reality that we live in. He's the only one fighting back against the radical left. He's he's actually he's fighting back against censorship. He's fighting back against big tech censorship. And like all I criticize Trump all day long. I criticize Trump on um you know, spending federal spending policies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I criticize tr and like, like, sure, maybe I am more like I'll admit that, like, I'm going to be more likely to try to justify or explain away or rationalize or something Trump has done. Um, but it doesn't it, I, I would never do it in such a way as that it actually like violates or makes it so I'm not like respecting my own principles and stuff. Okay. Um, I, I was hoping then we could actually get in the merits and on some of these issues. Um, so 
I want to talk about the First Amendment with respect to um, Section 230, right? You've you've stated before previously that you think um, there should be changes to the law and maybe even a constitutional amendment to change how far-reaching free speech um, is applied to. I don't can think you, can you explain I don't more think about I've that? ever talked about a constitutional amendment oh, on free speech. I thought I, I heard it at, maybe on the Dylan Burns channel. I'm not sure. Maybe it was with reference to something else. So could you just uh, – but maybe I misrepresented you. Could, could you say more about the kind of changes to the law that you want to see um, with respect to the First Amendment and for shield uh, liability shields for um, – so so-called computer tech. Companies. Well, I don't want I don't want any changes to First Amendment law other than okay. to other than to continue to expand the right of free speech. Okay. So what I, the 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 change in the laws I want are designed to actually encourage um, the policy re and the the values behind the First Amendment. Um, and so, for example, one of the main proposals I've proposed is. Um, I've proposed a new a new federal cause of action, a, a new statutory. Claim. Oh, that's right. Okay, that was it. Maybe I, I confused that with um, maybe yeah. some other issue. And so okay. what I would what I would say is, and this is a side, this is a, a separate from Section two thirty, and I, I think Section two thirty. Okay. I don't think I don't think you just get rid of Section two thirty. I'm not I'm not in favor of just getting rid of Section two thirty. I think you change it in certain ways. So we can talk about that. But my other okay. proposal is to create a federal cause of action, which would mean. Um, that that not notwithstanding the terms of service that require arbitration, um, notwithstanding any contracts you sign, but if you are let's say big tech for example, and you could qualify that in the statute and say if you're a if you're a social media platform with X number of, of X users, size. yeah, and then yeah. and then you know that would be that would apply to you, and then if if that happens, and then second of all. And then if you do certain things like number one, let's say you apply you apply your terms of service in a discriminatory manner and you 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 apply your terms in an unfair, um, inconsistent, discriminatory manner or mm -hmm. um, you apply your terms of service in such a way that it would violate the First Amendment if it was done by a government government, <laughs> then then your users can sue you. And you should get you should get statutory damages of maybe you know ten attorneys fees attorneys fees and then tri <laughs> triple and then triple um like punitive damages or compensatory damages yeah at triple damages yeah. and punitive damages and everything else this and and look like Holy this shit. is not something this is not something that typically would come from a conservative like this is no. something that Democrats <laughs> would like I mean this is a trial lawyers the trial lawyer bonanza would come from this and like this would create so many lawsuits and that's sort of typically like a left-wing democrat position but here's the thing on some things like, i agree on like civil you, rights stuff. like yeah. you have to like you have to look at the big picture and you have to be able to realize um you know pick your battles and figure out whether it's worth it to sort of um do certain things and like look we've got we've got a system where the regulations are out of control we've got a system where there's all kinds of different statutory causes of action there like on this issue which is the first amendment issue it's a free speech issue it's a free and open debate issue on this issue the number one issue the most important thing in a, in a free society is free and open debate on this issue that is not the time to be super hardcore you know libertarian and, and be opposed to you know federal regulation and stuff it's like I wish we didn't have to do this. I wish we wouldn't have to do this. But the fact is, is that we've got big tech, which is insanely powerful. It is mm -hmm. the de facto public square. We, we've debated this on Twitter. It's, on Twitter. it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the de facto public square. It's where, it's where Americans engage in political discussions and, and everything else. And they're tyrannical and they're leftist and they're biased and they're discriminatory and they they're censorious and they're book mm -hmm. burners. They're digital book burners. And it's horrible for society and it needs to be remedied. And, dude, it would be awesome. Like, I can't believe these leftists who pretend to be. Oh, we care about the creators. We, we care about streamers. We care about content creators. There is nothing that would give individual small creators, individual small streamers more power 
and more ability to fight back and more ability to ensure fairness and, and fair treatment by big tech than what I'm proposing. And it's res absurd that any of these leftists on Twitch disagree with it. Uh, I have a couple of questions about that. So, so one is, what do you say to the claims by, here's, a, I guess, a more fundamental question. Do you think big tech companies, you, you, you said maybe the cause of action should be based maybe one on whether or not their terms of service are being applied in a discriminatory fashion or arbitrarily. What if the terms of service themselves are arbitrary and discriminatory? Doesn't a company have a, um, now, before we get into the de facto public square stuff, um, assuming for a moment that it isn't a de facto public square, shouldn't a company, a social media company, have the right to have discriminatory and arbitrary terms of service policies? I mean, uh, 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 let's say I want to be a democratic safe space forum where only Democrats are allowed. It's a social media company, let's say. I know that's not what Twitter is, but shouldn't that company have the right to have terms of service that are themselves arbitrary and discriminatory? Sure. I mean, sure. As, as an, on an initial sort of pass, like you start with the assumption that, yeah, they have the right to do this. But you can take any law and any regulation – and start with the premise that, hey, no, I have the right to do this. Well, you have the right to do it until now you don't anymore because it's a federal law and it's and it's a federal regulation. Mm -hmm. And so um, and and frankly, maybe the you know, maybe the this is I mean, I recognize that what I'm proposing is a little bit more extreme than than you could do this through Section 230 and make it more voluntary right. where you could say where you could say, um, look, if if companies if companies want to remain um if companies want to remain uh, protected from liability under Section 230, then they have to comply with this, that, and the other thing. But mm -hmm. um, it's like, do, do companies do companies have the right to discriminate against you based on your sex? Do companies have the right to discriminate against you based on your religion? Do, do companies have the right to discriminate against you based on your race? Do no. I mean, you, so all, we're, all we're doing, all we're doing is adding political um, belief political belief to the a protected class yeah and um see uh so i, so I don't know how that are you allowed to have a website that says if you are black you're not allowed to use this social media platform i wonder i would say um, no i actually don't know that i i know with respect to like employment obviously you have title seven but um no for any instance, any no any any racial discrimination by any company, I think is illegal. I could be wrong on that, but I'm like ninety yeah, percent sure. So your whole idea that oh well, this is forced, this is forced speech, and this is a for violation of the First Amendment. Yeah. It's like well, no more so than saying that you know you can't you can't ban somebody off your platform based on their race. Now it what now, about okay, black so people need do, but are, is that is that now forced speech where you're forced to you're forcing people to to host certain races that they that they don't want to host. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Who cares? It's more important. Getting rid of racial discrimination is more important than your yeah, damn no, right I, to not want to host a certain race. I I, I agree. Um, just two points. One is um, the countervailing interest here is another sort of free speech First Amendment uh, sounding injury, which is not the First Amendment right of the of the speaker who's being discriminated, but the First Amendment right of whatever company company you're talking about who has to host this content. Um, and we might say, well, that's a trade-off we're willing to have, and maybe maybe I'm willing to have that trade-off, but but it is another First Amendment right. I don't know why one should necessarily win out over the other. And I guess my second point is with respect to the racial discrimination, um, what about things like Black People Meet or like J-Date? Those are like dating websites that are tailored to a specific race now i don't know that in their terms of service they say you're not allowed to use this if you're white maybe it's not so explicit but it, it's kind of a de facto uh racial discrimination um in the title no, so there wouldn't is, that yeah, but there is there is no race dude let me tell you a story when yeah. i was in law school i got an email from the law school that said this uh, there's a there's a really wonderful scholarship opportunity it's a it's a minority it's a minority uh, minority promotion scholarship opportunity here. Click here to apply. And I was like, man, wait, what? How can they specifically offer a scholarship, you know, based on your race? 
And yeah. I, 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 and so I was, I emailed them and I was like, um, can I apply for this? Do I qualify for this? Even though I'm not a, I forget what the, what the minority group was. I think it was, it was yeah. a race of, it was like African Americans or Hispanics yeah. or something, a, a scholarship that was literally advertised and sent out as being a scholarship for African Americans or Latinos or something. And I responded and, and applied and or responded and said, Hey, can I apply for this? And they said, yes, you can. No, just like, because by it's, by, it's, by the terms of the actual thing that you weren't well yeah so so I, I get what you're saying that like a lot of the times these uh things that they say that they're one race are actually by their terms they're open to other races um right and it's just that, I, I, it's yeah. just that only i mean it's just that in it's just not gonna work out that it, way. it's a good point and and I'm, I'm not trying to i'm not trying to say that it would never be acceptable to impose some obligation on social media companies, social media companies who already have good amount of power and capital, right, to withstand changes in regulation, they, you know, prepare for changes in regulation. So I'm, I'm not trying to make a parade of horribles argument with respect to like um, the stock price of, of Twitter or whatever this co company they are. But what do you say to, because I've heard you have this debate before, to people like Bastia and Destiny who have said to you, this will just destroy social media as we know it. Do you have a response to that? Yeah, or is your response, so... well, it should be destroyed in the way we know it and it should be different. No, it, it's it's complete garbage, dude. It's, that's, it's not true. I mean, think about how stupid that is to say, oh my gosh, if 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 you allowed some a, a country lawyer to to sue Facebook, they'd go under. They'd, they'd completely go under. They'd never exist. It gets preposterous. Like every single country, every single company in this country is subjected to lawsuits. They can defend themselves against lawsuits just like everybody else. Well, but what would you say to, well, yes, they, they could, but they're not going to get into that game. And what they're going to do is now they're just going to, they're going to curtail their user generated content platforms and paradoxically in an attempt to increase um speech and to increase discourse what you're doing is actually chilling speech in a practical sense because the end result is companies will with, without the liability shield they're just not going to tolerate um conversations without heavy curation what do you say to that if freedom to speak means nothing if there's no platforms to speak and if these platforms are, are just don't want to deal with the the loss of the liability shield well now you just don't have a forum to, to speak is, is that a concern that you find a availing no, or you think it's overblown that that that's something that is put out by big tech to try to convince people why they should get the special dispensation and it's to 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 honestly believe that it means you you've fallen you've fallen for the the scam by big tech and you're a you're being i mean you're being tricked by big tech i mean the, the, it's just so whole wrong and it's like um no, it, it, like the, this idea that big tech wouldn't exist unless unless the federal government passed a statute that protected them that like nobody else gets protection. It's just wrong. It's it's this I it's like they're shilling they're shilling for big tech by making this preposterous claim not supported by anything that they're going to all go under and they're going to they're going to stop doing it. It's like look if if they did Good. Then there's going to be a bunch of other companies that rise up to pl take their place because this is a huge, important, you know, industry. They're not going to just they're not just going to go away. Well, but but but, but Lexer fan, I, uh, here's I'll give you a hypo. Right. So you're Twitter now and Twitter um, Twitter d keeps on its policies. So and by the, the, the new federal standard that we've enacted, they, they've lost their liability shield. Um, and now, well, hold um, on. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about yeah. just taking away their liability shield for, um, stuff that's posted on their website. So like yeah. I'm, on, on, under none of my proposals would Facebook be liable if some bad actor went on and post child pornography on it. I'm not proposing that. Well, I'm pro I am proposing that if, so uh, to, we haven't even really yeah. talked about my, what I would propose to do with Section oh, yeah, 30. What yeah. I would propose that you do with Section 230 is, um, and frankly, there's some support for this in the actual text of the statute right now, which where it requires good faith moderation. I would say to, to, to clarify Section 230 and say, okay, 
these big tech companies they can still have their li they can still have their liability protections um, for you know content that's posted by third parties um, that would that would potentially expose them to liability for example child porn for, mm -hmm. which I guess that frankly you know what section 230 that was it was designed it was designed to um, to enable tech platforms um, to ban child pornography that's what it was designed for and it's been it's been so blown oh, out of proportion I, and then expanded I, and stuff yeah. so, 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 I, so I'm saying so in order for them in order for them to maintain that in order for them to maintain their liability protections they should uh, they 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 should not be allowed to discriminate against people based on on politics and they should not be able to violate um, people's you know reasonable huh. free speech oh, rights. Well, and they okay. have to and they have to engage in um, good faith moderation what they're doing now is not good faith moderation and that's where I say there's support for what I'm saying in the text of the statute and this is why this is why the Trump administration was able to do what they did with an executive order and this is why there's a lot of hope for the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. To because the Supreme Court and the and the courts have massively expanded Section 230, and there's been almost no enforcement of the current text, which requires good faith enforcement. And I'm sorry, but banning people because you don't like their politics is not good faith moderation. Uh, I see. So, so you, as I understand Section 230, there's essentially like two liability shields. One is with respect to posting of content by uh, third parties, right? And you would keep that shield no matter what, correct? So if someone no, posted, I would say post I would say that they would lose that shield if they engage in political discrimination. Oh, but they okay. would be so, able to keep it. But that's the thing like that. That's where it's like, OK, you, you really think they're all going to go under. They're going to quit doing this. It's like, no, they're not. What they're going to do is they're going to stop discriminating against people. And they're going to be they're going to do a better job of respecting uh, free speech rights because if they don't then they lose it so in order for them to keep their liability protection they have to stop um violating people's free speech rights or discriminating based on political viewpoint um and and or and you know treating people unfairly or you know inconsistent enforcement of their tos all of those things they should be would be cognizable as a federal cause of action well, not only that, but they, they should have to comply with those in order to maintain their liability protection. So you, you create an incentive right. for them. You create an incentive for them to not go around banning people they don't like. Uh, so let's get away some of the obnoxious complaints um, out of the way so that you can we can get to the meat of it. So obviously someone spamming political opinions, you would say if they're banning a political spammer, that's OK, because the basis of banning is the spam, not the content. Right. If that were the case. Right. So you th that gets rid of a lot of the criticisms, which are like, well, you're just going to let spammers ruin platforms. Right. Um, so there's a critique that like, um, well, if you just make it so that you can't discriminate based on a uh, on anything. Right. Or you sorry, you cannot ban based on anything. Can you ban based on spamming? That that has to be a grounds for for banning or just like well, I guess content, I mean right? I think you would ha I think you would have to clarify it I I don't necessarily um I just don't know what's and, a workable and, standard right so what if, what if you say something like I believe that um we should change our laws to make a uh, child uh, like I'm in favor of NAMBLA right um would that would banning that person for promoting this change to a law be a political dis like discrimination yes uh, okay but here's so, the thing about well, the spam but you with go, to go back to spam yeah. you would have to clarify yeah. what you're talking about with quote unquote spams and, and it would be different for each platform for example i'm not proposing that so for example let's let's say twitch uh if somebody's spamming in your chat the actual Twitch user banning that person from their chat, that's not even something that the platform is doing. So that that's the the that has no really impact on the platform. What we're talking right, that's about. Use, that's those are user tools. It yeah, and what I mean is, Yeah, so yeah. the user tools would still be there. And same with like Twitter. If if somebody's spamming you on Twitter or, or replying to all your tweets or something, the users could still ban that person. Um, and so then the question becomes well, then what are you really talking about with spam? Like, for example, if you're a yeah. Twitter user, if you're a Twitter user and you're just tweeting out um, spam, 
uh, who is that harming? It, nobody's seeing it unless you unless there's followers. Well, the platform says it makes our product worse. And they said that that's our injury. The product is now worse because, uh, and and so our our ground for you know we've gotten a report that you're a prolific spammer. You're clogging our feeds, and we we don't we're not getting rid of you because of your political opinion. We just think that you're bad for business. Yeah, I mean, I mean, tech. I mean, I don't think that's a problem. No, I, I mean, okay. I think that would be fine. And that doesn't okay. go. That doesn't run afoul of. Uh, of what my policy goals are, which is to encourage free and open debate. And so, you know, I think you would still, though, you, there would still be requirements to to how you they should have to um, deal with spam. They they can't they can't use spamming as a sort of a pretext pretext to engage in other things. Well, but. that's that that dovetails with my next question, which is, who is in charge of administering this this working standard? Is it the companies themselves, or is it some? federal agency or is it the courts themselves or is it a combination of all well, these and under, you can appeal un, under uh, well um it would be mostly under what i'm proposing it would be mostly private litigants in the in the court so for example okay. if you know and that's and that's who really has the incentive to to and that's who's harmed i mean that's who's harmed and those are the people that should be compensated so for example but who's going to court for example is, like, alex sorry, sorry. jones yeah. alex jones uh should be able to sue these companies that banned him uh, but but okay that's a good example of someone who might have the money and the inclination well anybody and... would know that you're not going to have money because you're going to be you're going to be awarded attorney's fees and and trouble damages and but it's still a risk fees, so they'll right? be able to um they'll be able to get their get attorneys but my my concern is if, if you are putting this in the hands of courts and often article three courts or, or i guess if it's a federal cause of action it could still be litigated in state courts um but if you put it in the hands of courts, it's not going to I don't I don't think it's going to be a, a great boon necessarily to the individual who is either not motivated enough or not um, doesn't want to take the risk in going to court to sue. So it seems like you would really need like private attorney generals in the form of your Alex Joneses and your, you know, people. Well, that, who, yeah, that's who, all you would need, though, because you're not like. The idea that this is going to spawn a, a 10 million lawsuits is preposterous. There's going to maybe be one or two lawsuits, and then the companies are going to fix their behavior. And that's the real goal. So the, the, the idea is not to have 10 million lawsuits where all these all these people that have been ban unfairly banned win lawsuits. That's it's not the goal. threat of lawsuits. The goal, yeah, the, the goal is to, to – you, you change the law to create incentives for these companies to allow free and open debate. And that that's the real – policy goal and you don't need to have tons of people suing constantly you just need to have the that the ability for people to do it and the and that you're going to fix the behavior that's the problem okay let me let me give you a a real hypo imagine I've, I've passed your law um twitter and facebook have changed some of their policies and now we have a case imagine trump comes back in 2020 uh, uh to run in 2024 um and he a story comes out saying that he did something absolutely horrific um, for which there's absolutely no proof and um, it's total, total fake news and media companies want to protect the American electorate from this horrible fake news that is infecting the minds of millions of people and like bending their minds to a reality that's just not wrong, not right. Let's say that we have evidence that it's coming from China or some other uh, country that hates Trump or something like that. And the media companies like, no, 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 we, we, we can't allow this to, to happen again. We have to, we have to stop this fake news from being spread. Wouldn't it be the case that under your standard, they couldn't do that. Correct. So they have to allow this fake news story yes. to fester um, and potentially have horrible, horrible results. If the if the free speech means anything, shouldn't it mean having uh, an informed discussion, or is it no. is it really just absolute? Whoever's the loudest voice, um, you know, we we can't touch anything at all, even if it's super super corrosive and obviously fake. You would say something like, Dude, "Well, who determines fact, if it's in, fake? in fact." In fact, what you're describing is the most important type of speech to protect. 
And that's specifically it, that's what the founding father said is that it's it's the unpopular speech that needs the protection. And so what you're basically saying is is free speech a good idea or not? Yes, free speech is a good idea. The way that you deal with those things is with more speech, not less. You don't you when 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 somebody says something you don't like, you don't try to ban them because they said something mm -hmm. you don't like. You don't try to shut down their speech. Instead, you offer your own speech and offer more speech to try to rebut it, and that's the open marketplace of ideas. It to have them to have an informed population, you have to have a marketplace of ideas where everybody's allowed to offer their own ideas and then whatever ideas uh, are backed up by the most evidence and logic and reason are the ones that end up winning in the end. That's the whole – I mean that's the entire premise behind free speech, this idea that just because it's some something yeah. bad that's going to have bad effects, of course that's not a reason to, to allow that to be banned. I mean – and look – it's that this is why it's like this is why free speech is unique in in world history. Free speech yeah. is very, very rare in world history throughout all of world history. Free speech is very rare. Absolutely. Because it's difficult. It's difficult to to um, say that, you know, somebody that's saying something bad should be allowed to say it. I mean, nobody wants to stand up for somebody to say something horrible. But you know what? That's what free speech is. That's what having principles means that i mean unpopular speech is the most important speech to to protect and so i get it that there's a there's obviously a knee-jerk emotional reaction to want to think and want to say oh hey you know this person said something bad or this person said something that's going to have negative effects let's just ban it just get rid of it i get that yeah. that's the easy way out that's the you know that's the way that you know throughout most of history that's how humans have dealt with it um, because that's kind of like your your emotional reaction to it. If somebody yeah. says something bad, you're going to want to ban it. But what we know is that long term and as you know, history has shown is that once you cross that line to where you're willing to shut up and, and burn like burn a book, essentially what, what you're talking about is digital book burning. I mean, we're talking about the idea of, hey, if somebody wants to put out a news story that we don't that's going to have negative consequences, we should burn that book. The, the end consequence I don't think it's of that quite is same, that you end but... up you end up actually doing way more damage because then. You know, maybe maybe it's an easy call the, the first time you do it. It's an easy, it's really a hard easy decision. It. it gets harder and harder and harder, and then you get close calls, and then you have disagreements over what should be banned and what should not be banned. That's why the better solution is to allow a free and open debate. I mean, uh -huh. it's amazing to me that the, yeah. in modern-day America, we are really tr we're truly, really debating whether free and open debate is a good thing or not. Well, and well, I've debated well, it a lot. Yeah. I've gone on all kinds of different panels where I'm literally debating – whether or not free speech is good or not. I mean, and that's why I was saying earlier, it's like, this is crazy that in the United States of America, we're at a point where there are many people who do not believe in the principles behind free and open debate. Well, I, hang on, but, but, but just one second here, because I, I think there is, I think what you're saying is absolutely true. And before, I, I know you're going to call me on this, but it is absolutely true of government action. And uh, any, any sort of government analysis, I, I don't even think the spam case of course, um, there would be challenges on First Amendment grounds, but it, it, it sounds like what you're doing really is incorporating the First Amendment jurisprudence of our country into private actors. And um, any action, and I guess you said this at, 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 the, at, the, at the start, any action that would be um, unconstitutional for the government to have done in a given case would be... Um, Un would be unlawful for the private company. Right. But um, but there's, a, I guess, a couple questions there. One is not all public space is a public forum, right? So we have forum analysis uh, that's done in various... Now, I agree with you that just because a space is privately owned doesn't mean that it's uh, not a public forum. Right. But there, but there is a lot of space in that, that's public where there are time, place, and manner restrictions on how speech is done, right? You, or restrictions on okay, you can't burn a cross here because this is a fire hazard, or um, in this place is a non-public forum designated or designated public forum for this kind of speech, but not that kind of speech. It sounds like even in our First Amendment jurisprudence for government action, there are different categories and 
different ways we can construe forms. And it seems like you're being needlessly absolutist with the private forms in a way that we wouldn't do with even government action. Well, Does any no, of that no, hold any way? I mean, okay. Okay. If, if our current laws, uh, uh, if current first amendment laws was applied to the government allows for time, place and manner restrictions. And I'm saying now apply that same jurisprudence to private actors. Okay. That means that you can still do time, place and manner restrictions. Okay. All right. All right. Perfect. All right. Does it Got not? It. Um, I mean, I'm, I, did it, I ever, did I ever say that, that we're, we're not only going to apply the first amendment, current first amendment law to private actors, but, um, but we're also going to get rid of the, uh, yeah. time, place and manner. I never said get rid of the time, yeah, place. Perfect. Perfect. So, so, so I, I, I misunderstood you because it, it sounded like some of the act, I, I guess we'd have a debate then. Uh, so applied on the online forums, what is a time, place and manner restriction? Um, because a lot of the time, place, manner restrictions, uh, in like a traditional public fora would be things like, will we have to close time? We have to close at this hour and that, which wouldn't necessarily map onto online forums. So I'm, I'm guessing as applied to the private forums, there would be a lot less justification for any given time, place, manner restriction. But I well, guess that's the one, kind of I mean, point. one that I could think of, um, for example, would be like, um, you know, no, uh, like, a, um, like Zoom. No targeted Zoom. harassment. Or well, no, no. But, it depends on what but, the, you mean by it. But like, for, for example, Zoom could prevent people from um, going into other people's um, calls. calls. You know, that would be yeah. one sort of restriction. So I guess I have another question, which is why limit this just to the platform itself? If, you're, if your principle is consistent, what gives you the right, lecture fan, one level of generality below to ban people on your individual channel? I understand that there's a difference here in terms of how the law is, but I mean, it, if we're just going to apply these principles of free speech down the board, why stop at sort of an arbitrary level of generality. What gives well, you the not, right to I'm ban not, I'm not applying it down the board. I'm applying it okay. to specific big tech. And the reason is, is because that's the um, de facto public square where people are exercising oh. all of their political speech. And so for me to ban somebody, for me to ban somebody, you know, from, from my chat, it's like, that's a tiny, tiny little corner where um, but it's not it's not censoring them in a, in a way that actually prevents um, free and open debate. I mean, there there's I um, see. So so really key to your analysis is that the big spaces for big tech have become so integral to our national conversation such that we have no choice but to treat them differently than smaller sized either creators or platforms. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it, the the premise is is that big tech is become the de facto public square, and they're incredibly powerful, and and that's that's where people engage in their free speech, and it and we we ought to as a society value free and open debate, and our our rights to engage in in speech that we're willing to put some regulations on some of the biggest and most powerful corporations in the world. Okay, but um, not, but not, but not necessarily apply it to you know small startups or individuals or things like that. I mean that's why I said at the beginning like you would have to put some qualifiers in to the to to this that you know look you have to have at least ten million view you have to have at least ten million users or you have to have you know some sort of sort of qualification to where that basically these laws would apply to. You know, maybe the top twenty tech company, you know, platforms or something like that. This is not. But if you, that, yeah. yeah. What if you're like a huge conservative site, right? So let's say Breitbart uh, makes a like a, a, a sort of competitor to Reddit, and it meets the threshold of the users that you have. Presumably, then, even though they've started as a conservative, they their bread and butter has been conservative. They've just reached the point where they become big. Now they have to, they can't ban people who are not conservative, correct? You wouldn't, you wouldn't make exceptions to if you started at some kind of political, uh, no, slant. no, I wouldn't. I mean, first of all, it would, I mean, it would have to be the, the threshold would have to be such that it's large enough to where it truly is a de facto public square. And I don't think, I don't think any, 
any website that is specific to one viewpoint would ever reach that level of being the de facto public square because it simply couldn't without having um, people from both sides on it. And so, um, you know, I, I, you're not gonna have you're not gonna have a bunch of leftists who are really, really, really interested in, in going on uh, on Breitbart and, and talking to people on Breitbart. But, mm -hmm. and if they do, and if it gets to the point where Breitbart's forums are as big and powerful as Twitter and Facebook, then yeah, I think it should apply to them. Okay. Um, I want to try to transition the conversation, but by the way, you can stop me anytime because I, I could talk to you forever. Um, no, so, good. Feel, okay. Um, so I, I, I don't agree with your policy prescriptions because I think, I think that you disagree with me on what the consequences of that will be. I, I think you think that, you know, people, these institutions have to deal with uh, regulations all the time. And there's a big negative effect of censoring people on the internet. I think that this is going to lead companies to be less respective of free, uh, free speech. If you implement what you said. Um, but I understand, I think your position more, and I don't think it can be characterized as totally a hundred percent loony. Um, as some people have done. So fair play there. My next question for you has to do with, with Trump's conduct. You've just told me, I think, or, or, or given a very admirable defense of free speech and you want it expanded in, into places where some people don't want it expanded. What do you say about Trump's assertion that he would want to ban flag burning? Oh, I'm, a, I, I'm against it. Okay. Okay. And it seems like he he doesn't have the same level of respect for sp free speech as you do. Well, Trump has never been like a like a hardcore constitutionalist in any way. He's a he's a pragmatist. He's not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, he he goes with his gut. I certainly understand the emotion and the gut instinct behind that, but. You know, as somebody who really does respect the the principles behind our constitution, I'm I'm not a, I'm not in favor of that. So one other principle of the constitution that I value a lot is a principle of the peaceful democratic transition of power. What do you think of Trump's lawyers' conduct, or and not just Trump lawyers' conduct, uh, lawyers from all parts of this country who are trying to challenge the results or what people claim are the results of the election do you think the conduct and um effectiveness of the of the lawyers doing this has been good shameful what is your what is your take on look i think what's been going on i think trump has a right to his day in court i can't believe that people that people on the left and democrats they want to they want to claim that they're on the side of fairness and justice and yet they want to deny a person their day in court. Trump has every right to a day in court just like everybody else does and to try to take that away from him I think is grotesque. Agree uh, agreed. I I think that he has a right to his days in court for however many claims he might have. Um my question is Trump has been more assertive than just saying, well, let's litigate this out. And he said that I know for sure there is fraud um, and that this election is clearly rigged. What do you think about those statements? Well, the, you the think reality- it's, You think it's clear that the election has been rigged? I don't, I don't think that it's, I don't, like if you're asking my honest opinion, I don't like deep down a hundred percent. No, either way. Like the, okay. what I think is the important thing and what I think may be one of the primary purposes of what Trump is doing, um, is pointing out to the American people that we have, we have a voting system and electoral systems now that are not secure. And we've made massive, massive changes over the last 40 mm -hmm. years. 50 years, mostly by Democrats and left wingers, you know, things like things like same day voter <laughs> registration, you know, uh, yeah. get getting rid of requirements to prove citizenship when you register uh, universal mail in ballots, um, accepting ballots after Election Day, you know, early voting, um, no requirements to show voter ID, no requirements to match signatures on absentee ballots. I mean, 
we could go on and I've got actually I've, yeah. I've been creating a list, but I've I've got like there's 20 to 30 to 40 major major voting law changes that Democrats have pushed through in in, in various levels of various states, um, in various successes, um, and and you'd agree those are constitutional, over- right? Like it's totally fine for a state to pass a law that in your mind lowers election security. Uh, sure, but there are limits to it. I mean, it you ha- the the limit is that um it can't be so bad as that it actually renders the the state government no longer a Republican form of government. Well, right, but that that lo- that question almost seems non justiciable as who, uh, what is the limit by which the election is. Um, insecure enough. I don't think so. Where... I mean, if you had, if you had, if you had a law that was passed that basically made it so, um, you know, whoever did the most fraud won. I think you could make a pretty good claim. <laughs> I think you could make a pretty good claim that 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 no longer is a Republican form of government, and the Constitution does um, guarantee and require that state governments be a Republican form of government. You know that. Uh, yeah, I. I, th- I think that that would be an interesting case uh, were it to be brought. My question is, do, do you think that there's evidence that exists? I, I understand your concerns about voter fraud. Um, do you think that there's evidence to suggest, first of all, do you have a problem with me qualifying what I'm saying when I say significant voter fraud? Do you have a problem with that qualifier when I, if, if I were to say that? Um. I mean, no, I mean, it depends on what you mean by that. I mean, for, okay. for with 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 the lawsuits and with election contests, um, most state law and I don't know if maybe this is federal law, too. But in, in order to succeed on any of the like voter fraud lawsuits, you do have to show that there was enough of it to impact right. the election. Like you can't you can't sue to overturn an election if you know that two people were were illegal voter fraud. Yeah. So on any of these um, now. Now, here's the thing. Even one piece of voter fraud, even one vote that was fraudulently illegally casted is a horrible dis, dis, or injustice and needs to be prosecuted and looked into and um, et cetera, et cetera. Because every, every illegal vote is disenfranchising an American citizen's vote. And so yeah, it's, it's, actually, the, it's yeah. actually the conservatives and Trump who are actually trying to – to ensure the right to vote and to make sure that every vote is counted and to make sure that we, nobody's disenfranchised and everything else. Like that's one but of the there, things that bugs me the most is this idea that, Oh, it's Trump and the Republicans who are actually trying to disenfranchise voters. But, no, we're trying to make sure that other pe- that American citizens votes aren't diluted with the legal ones. I, I understand the, the dilution argument, but, but he, he's more than that. Right. So, so for uh, on the fraud ones, I understand that. But take into consideration, and I want to get into the conduct of the lawyers in a bit. Take take the facial challenge to what well, I think is Act 77 in the Pennsylvania uh, state court system that's going on right now. I think they just appealed it. They just issued a petition for cert. Um, that is a facial challenge to a law proposed and passed by Republicans, signed by a Democratic governor, which proposed to extend mail-in voting to – um everyone in the state right that the the people of that state relied on their state government's advice and their laws when they went to vote they relied on it for two elections before the one we're talking about right now the 2020 election namely the primaries and now after the election happened republicans who themselves uh, use this law for several elections before this one are trying to mount a facial challenge that that law is unconstitutional under the Pennsylvania constitution. Isn't that the most cynical, um, most uh, immoral why, and, and thing you why, could possibly why, do? Why is it, what's their legal argument for why it's unconstitutional? So, well, the legal argument is that it's facially void because part of the constitution says that absentee ballots. Now this is where you can have a, the, the conversation, right? That, the Constitution sets out that absentee ballots have to meet certain criteria. You can either interpret that criteria as like a ceiling that, okay, mail-in ballots can't be universal. It has to be according to the criteria laid out for absentee ballots. Or you could interpret that as a minimum, that whatever the, the Pennsylvania legislature does 
it has to allow absentee ballots for this specific class of people, which like military people and like college kids, right? So that's the constitutional argument. And maybe it's a valid argument to have, but the remedy can't be we invalidate all of these these votes well, after the all, fact. Hold on. First Commit. of all, it's not uh first of all, Trump the Trump campaign That's not Trump, is, yeah. Is not the is not the um is not the same thing he has as no the standing. is not yeah. the same thing as the Republicans that passed the law in the first place. So it's not I, the I same understand. people doing it. But no, if no, but look, it is, here, it is, here's right, the thing, no, you don't you don't say that that remedy is so bad because, you know, people who relied on it, their votes got thrown out. It's not their it's not Trump the Trump campaign's fault that they did this illegally and in fact, the persons that you've got to be mad about for disenfranchising those people are the legislators and the governor that passed a con unconstitutional law. And I'm sorry, but the Constitution, including the state Constitution, trumps the legislature. And just because people relied on the legislature's unconstitutional law doesn't change the fact that it's unconstitutional. And so, really? yes, it is horrible. It is a bad it is. A, it is an unfortunate situation. I agree with you. This is what I one of the biggest things I I hate about leftist argument tactics is it's all in motion and you bring up, oh, this is so sad. Look, at they're going to get disenfranchised. OK, OK, it is emotional. It is sad. But you know what? It's their fault for passing an unconstitutional law. It's not the Trump campaign's fault for wanting the Constitution to be followed. A couple of things. So one is I I think it is the same litigants as, as the perpetrators here, because the the actual plaintiffs are state uh, legislatures. So uh, Trump, it's not a Trump lawsuit because I don't think he would have standing to sue for it. Um, that said, it, it, this is not an emotional appeal. The question, the, the court oftentimes has choice of remedy. They could issue like declaratory judgment saying, all right, for future elections, this law is not a law because it contravenes the constitution. But um, th they can have a choice of remedy. I think asking the court to invalidate a law that you passed with the Republican majorities in a bipartisan fashion after the election has uh, multiple elections have happened, you know, this challenge wouldn't have happened if the Republicans had won uh, that election. And it just seems like a, a cynical way to try to upset and disenfranchise tons of people. And it's not necessary because all you could do is ask the court and, and the court's not going to grant it because they already, they ruled on latches. Um, but all the court would have to do is, is say that for future elections, this, uh, this law is null and void. Um, well, I don't even know. I have no idea if, if what you're saying is true. I've never heard okay, of this yeah. idea that it's this, Pennsylvania. Le, this P Pennsylvania legislator, he voted for this law and passed this law. And then now that same legislator, it's like, okay, so the guy, well, so it's, whatever, it's whatever the, per, whatever the same person is, they passed an unconstitutional law and now are claiming it's unconstitutional. Okay. That's bad. Yeah. Big deal. But, like, I don't even know if that's true, but it's like, okay, it's bad. Yeah. But you know what? That doesn't change the fact that the Pennsylvania Constitution sh is needs to be followed. And you know what? Maybe the maybe the maybe those people that did it, maybe they made a mistake. Maybe they said, "Hey, you know what? We passed this. We didn't really realize how bad this was. We had no I we had no idea that the Democrats would abuse it like this. We we now realize that what we did was wrong. It's in, in, improper. We're going to try to fix it in the next legislature. But also, we've got to file suit here because this the Constitution wasn't followed. What what would you think? I mean, and obviously you're not a partisan hack. So if the Democrats had did the same thing and then claim I am partisan, on... I'm a Republican. I, I make no uh, bones about it. I'm oh, but, a Republican. But you're not you're not a hack. Right? So, so a hack would say something like, well, if the Democrats had passed an unconstitutional law and that law had bit them in the ass and then they tried to claim that that law was unconstitutional, what, like, you, your, the result has to be the same, right? If you're being consistent, that if it's unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional. It doesn't matter who passed it. Well, well, yeah, but this okay. is but we are talking about politics and it's like, look, I think I think what's best for the country is that Republicans win. And so I, I would I there like this idea that, you know, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you support Republicans. <gasps> you you're so like, what a hack you support Republicans. It's like, no, I'm a Republican. I, 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 I don't think you're a hack you support like, Republican. No, but that's a lot, like what of a lot of a lot of people say, like, uh -huh. oh, my gosh, you're supporting you're supporting the Republicans when they when they do something um, and then you're not supporting the Democrats when they do something different. And it's like, of course I'm not. It's like, I'm a Republican, but like there's, if it's the exact same thing, then 
um, okay. then I would then I would apply it equally. But you know, I I'm not I I'm not gonna make apologies or bones about the fact that I'm gonna try to figure out political and legal ways to support the Republicans because I think that's what's best for the country. Yeah, no, I, I would I wouldn't expect you to. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That you know, I'm I support usually Democrats, and I'm gonna be interested in ways legally to help the Democrats. I right, don't think and I'm not. And there, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, uh, totally agree on that. I, I, I guess it, I'm. What, what's troubling me is that a lot of these lawsuits seem facially ridiculous, and and I know that it's. How can I possibly say that? Well, one is look at the track record, right? A lot of these cases are being dismissed because. Okay, that's the, fine. Let there's me, no let, I evidential even, basis. Because, I know. Let me. I didn't even. I didn't even get to finish. Like yeah, my sorry, initial. Sorry. Like when we first started talking about this, but I don't necessarily think that the primary purpose of any of this is for these lawsuits to win or for to overturn the election or anything like that. The mo one of the maybe the most important things going on right now and maybe the most valuable for America and maybe one of the greatest things Trump w will end up doing, one of the greatest legacies of Trump could be finally exposing and educating the American people on the horrible shit that the Democrats have passed in terms of our voting I I laws. And so what all of these lawsuits are doing, what all of these hearings are doing, what everything that Trump is doing and saying is doing – is exposing the fact that we do not have secure elections anymore. We used to have secure elections. We used to have processes where our elections were secure, and we don't anymore. And How do regardless, you possibly regardless, regardless of what happens with these lawsuits, regardless of any any of this, um, we the the fact that this is informing the American people, and hopefully, over the next couple of years, the Republicans who dominated in state legislatures all across the country can can start passing laws so that we can have a secure election next time and that's the most important thing and if we and if this all if all of this spurs a bunch of states all across the country mm -hmm. to pass voting security laws to where we can have free and fair elections on the next time around that could be one of the greatest things to have, have ever happened to the united states how uh how can you possibly square what you just said there with statements from the Trump administration that this election was secure. So you have statements by the Trump administration is never. Oh, you're talking about like the guy that got fired for saying it. Him, uh, Bill Barr, from the Justice Department. Uh, That's not I mean, what Bill the, Barr the, said. The, I understand, but uh, the, he, he didn't. Bill Barr he didn't said say, that Bill Barr has yeah. said we don't have it. We, we the per we have the, the Department of Justice, which is only interested in criminal, in criminal. cases. Yeah. That, that's I, okay, and, and not, not that they finish. So yeah. that you're misrepresenting. What these I, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to. I, I'm not trying to say that Bill Barr said that the, the election was the safest in history. All I'm trying to say is Bill Barr took an affirmative decision to say that they hadn't found evidence of significant voter fraud yet um, with respect to criminal matters. He didn't have to say that, right? If you're Bill Barr, why would you? Why, why Dude, release that thing I mean, today? You, you don't even. Everybody knew that without him even saying it. You know how you can tell that that's the case. The department, no of, the and... department of Justice hasn't filed anything or or yeah indicted anybody. Like it, it's, there's why nothing new about that. Why? Well, because well, it's why, obvious. Why, it's like why not say it? It's off. Everybody knows that. And it's like that got it's Trump not saying anything. Upset. That got the the Trump legal team um, upset. And now Republicans are – some Republicans and Trump supporters are calling out the Justice Department specifically. Um, and why do that? If, if, if it's obvious, why risk your relationship with Trump and Trump allies? It seems like well, there's a because, reason he's, because, he said because, it. Because the, re the reason is, is because it's not a big deal. It doesn't really mean much. It's, there's nothing new. It's, it's totally being blown out of proportion by the left people like you right now trying to make it into this huge deal when it's just not it's like what what a criminal what a criminal um enforcement division says about what they have found has no bearing on whether um there was a a, a civil case that can be made or something and so um, it's just you're you're making it out to be this huge thing oh my gosh oh my gosh bill barr said this and it's like dude 
that's not a big deal. Like we knew that. Like the okay, the Department of Justice hasn't indicted people for uh, voter fraud that ha that that had enough vote that did enough yeah. voter fraud to switch an election. We know that. We knew that. This is not new. You're blowing it out of proportion to try to to make your own partisan points when it's just well, really not that. Big uh, that's of a not deal. what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm I'm trying to indicate that if it's true that federal law enforcement, state law enforcement, no uh, state prosecutors, federal prosecutors haven't found anything significant yet and that uh whatever the fired guy krebs or whatever made that statement and no one in the republican legislatures in uh, all over uh who, are, who ran these elections are finding a lot of evidence of significant voter fraud again i'm qualifying there just to just to guard myself against the claim that you know that maybe there is some proven allegations of some voter fraud um doesn't that stand in direct opposition to your claim that Trump is exposing the flaws in our, in our security system? In, in other words, the fact that nothing has been found yet of consequence, doesn't that undermine the notion that there's a huge problem? No, it doesn't. It be, the, the reason is obvious because you know what? When, when you commit fraud, you, you try to hide it. You, you try oh. to make it so you can't get caught. And so um, for, you know, when, and when when you have laws on the books that do things like you know you know allow this stuff to ha like a lot of stuff to happen that makes it easy to do it and not get caught the point the point is is that he, he Trump is exposing a system that makes it so you can commit fraud and not get caught if if nothing is ever found what what evidence would con would convince you that there's already Alexis been a lot of stuff found by the way. Oh, okay. There's but lots of evidence. It, it, is there any evidence that would convince you that our election system is secure? What would it take to convince you? Well, I wouldn't take evidence to convince me that our election was secure. We need changes in the laws. And there's about there's a long list of about 20 things uh, that I think we ought to do at the state state by state level to secure the election, including things like you know, require, ID no, no, yeah. no, no same day voter registration, no universal mail in ballots, voter ID sit, required to prove citizenship when you registered. Make sure the state should have to clean up their voter rolls. Every, I mean, the idea, the I like it's preposterous to suggest that this was a free, a, a, a secure election when you've got, you know, for a fact that the voter rolls are not up to date. You know for a fact that there are dead people on the voter rolls, you know, for a fact that there are people on the voter rolls that have moved. And yet you're still sending out ballots to him. I mean, that's a f you, there's no disputing that. There is dispute in that. I think there isn't. Yeah. Well, I mean, what what is the use? I'll, I'll give you a question. And you'll answer it. Uh, hopefully, what is the use in having perfect voter rolls if um, people impersonating others isn't a huge problem, or there hasn't been uh, many incidents of that found? In, in our history what why go through such cost to like make sure that our voter rolls are as clean as possible if there's barely any utility to such costs does that make sense it doesn't seem to make it, sense it, it does it, yeah. it, it doesn't make sense why you would be you would you would not want to secure the election and just because just because you know you haven't caught somebody doing a crime doesn't mean that a crime didn't happen. Not every not every single crime is is caught, and especially fraud. Not every not every single time somebody commits fraud is it caught. The whole point of fraud is you don't want to get caught. And so the reason that you, you you the reason that you want to secure the election and clean up your voter rolls and do all these other things is one of the most important reasons actually that you actually there's no disputing this is so that you can have public confidence in the outcome of the election. And to reduce to reduce the like the, the ability and the chances and the opportunity to commit fraud. But when you have the system that the Democrats have set up in many states where there's rampant opportunities for fraud and it's very difficult to prove it, you end up in a system that we have now where there's no public confidence in the results of the election, which is a very dangerous situation. Why do you want why do you want a continuous system where where you have such a lack of public confidence in the election results. We have a system now where there's not, there is a lot of people that do not have confidence that this was a free and fair yeah. election. Why would you want to continue a system where there's such a huge chunk of the, the American population that does not uh, a good question. have confidence in it?
Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And essentially my response to that is, I think people's concerns aren't rationally related to what's happening on the ground. And any number, any sort of level of security um, things that would have been here wouldn't have made a difference. You would still have had the same people claiming that this election was fraudulent. Whatever you, you can't win essentially is what I'm, what I'm claiming that these people um, here, I'm referring to Trump himself and his surrogates. There is no combination or array of laws that could have existed under which yes, Trump would is. say there's a, a free and fair election. This if, there if, you, absolutely if you think that is, I mean, I mean, he's, he's claimed voter fraud in the election. He won. He's claimed it in the primary that he won. He claims it every time he loses. So I don't know why we have any confidence. I mean, do you think the 2016 you're, election, you're really, I mean, the, the law, the, what the laws that I'm talking about that created this system were, are not just the universal mail in ballots that the Democrats came up with in 2020 and used I understand. coronavirus as a pretext that we're talking about assist the democrats democrats have been working for 40 years to make it so we don't have a we don't have the ability to verify that we had a free and fair election and let me ask you this why yeah. the f have democrats spent the last 40 years getting rid of all of our voter security laws yeah i, I think that's also a good question i i, I don't i don't you necessarily agree with, agree with the premise but I think a cynical answer is this, and this is the answer you're looking for, is um, Democrats know that low propensity voters and voters who don't have the security measures that you want tend to vote for them. And uh, that's, the, that's a cynical answer. The less cynical answer is, well, voting is a very important right in this country, and we should only have very good reasons for limiting people's access to that right. Right, and but, because uh, yeah, we, yeah. and the response yeah. to that is obviously that actually having a, having a secure election actually guarantees the access to vote and protects your right to vote because there's less likely the, of a chance that your vote gets canceled out and not counted because of a, a an illegal vote. But what if you could prove that, that that chance is very small to begin with? If 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 I could prove to you that it's actually the incidence of that kind of voter fraud is low anyway, then the marginally beneficial effects of less vote dilution. Um, are canceled out by the greater magnitude in the incidence of voting itself. So it could be the case that perhaps these laws actually prevent some amount of fraud. But what if getting rid of these laws just increases the number of voters exponentially? I mean, you could, you, you're never going to be able to convince me of that because in order to convince me of that, you're going to have to convince me that having, a, having an ID – um, is this huge, huge burden? And then, and then you get into the racist Democrats who are ta who start yeah, talking about how certain races don't have IDs and stuff but, like that, which is obviously yeah. just racist and horrible. But, and you're never going to be able to convince well, me. Well, I, I didn't make a race. I didn't make a race. ID is some horrible, huge burden. Oh my gosh! If you require an ID, oh my gosh! So many people can't vote. So many people don't have IDs. Give me a break. Well, I'm not speaking in, in positive terms. I'm, I'm, I'm merely suggesting that that's a way that you could you could square the the vote dilution. Uh, but my I guess I have another question for you, which is, um, do you think the right to vote is something that should be hard in general to um, exercise? Hold on. Sorry. Say that again. I missed yeah. that. Do you think that the right to vote should be something that's difficult to exercise for most normal people? No. Okay. Um, it's not you difficult. would reject. It's, it's it's not difficult to okay. to register in advance of the election and and prove your citizenship and then show up with an ID. Okay. So, uh, you you would reject claims that these voter ID laws and these security laws uh, lower voting rates. It may it may vote it, it may lower voting rates, but. Um, that doesn't mean that it, it's quote unquote difficult to vote. Okay. It just it just uh, means that there there are some people out there who are lazy and and they don't even care about their own right to vote enough to register in advance of the election and then show up with an ID to vote. So and you don't want those people motivated anyway. So you don't want those people voting anyway if they don't have the will to I, vote. I, I, I don't. Care. Here's what I don't want. I don't want people voting who are comp who don't even know who the candidates are and and this idea this idea that it's a good thing if if people go in and they just guess on the ballot 
How, how is that going to? How are you going to get good uh, results by having people vote who literally don't know who the candidates are and don't know anything about politics and don't have never spent time informing themselves? I think we need a massive cultural shift um, to where we encourage responsible voting. You know, you know what a responsible voter does? A responsible voter, when filling out their ballot, if there's a race, um, most likely going to be a local race where you don't know either of the people. You don't vote. You leave that per place blank. Yeah. I've I've left I've left places blank races on you don't ballots know. before. That's a responsible yeah. a responsible voter does not vote in races where they have no clue who the people are. Well, uh, uh, two things. One is this kind of stands in stark contrast to your view of a fundamental right, namely first uh, uh, free speech. So on one hand, you say you know first the, your first amendment right should never be curtailed on the basis of like how smart your speech is or like what's the content of the speech is unless with, you know, with clear exceptions, of course, that we've, we've talked about at length uh, and it should be unbridled, right. Un uh, at burden at all your first amendment. Right. But your right to vote, you know, we really should care about whether or not you're a good voter or whether or not you're informed. No, it seems like I'm not, an no, I'm not talking value. about, no, I'm not talking about curtailing anything that on, in terms of being a responsible voter, that's a cultural uh, cultural societal value that I think we need to have a change in. And for, I, I'm totally down for, um, you know, cultural values that encourage responsible speech too. And in, in fact, that's what you get when you have free speech is, is actually you get, you get people drowning out with, with a lot more speech, all of the bad speech and the negative speech. So I have no problem with with the, say a cultural value that says you know do not promote racism, do not promote Nazism, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, but you don't that, want it enacted with any laws that 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 or any free, policies. Yeah, that's, which, that's free speech. Yeah. That's how you. That's how free speech works. Well, I could say the same thing with voting. I, think I want to encourage people to vote and be smart about it, but I'm not going to put, make any laws that that tailor or restrict voting to some arbitrary level of engagement because I just I trust people to exercise their franchise responsibly. Okay, I, I, but it's not I, it's not arbitrary and it's not restricting it. These are basic, basic security measures to to actually protect other people's right to vote. Like you're actually by by making it more likely that voter fraud occurs, you're actually you know making it l likely that somebody's vote doesn't count. You're actually disenfranchising with the delusion. people. And and yeah, and yeah, it's it's not. I buy you're that. not like you're not restricting people's right to vote by making them have an ID or something like that. That's not a restriction. And that that's a that's a reasonable security measure. It's not it's, it's not restricting anybody. It's not preventing a single person. Not a single person is prevented from voting under any of these proposals. OK, I, I, I guess I disagree on the merits there. Um, uh, or I guess on the practical effect of it, although if, if you're taking sort of an individual uh, liberty approach to it, I suppose uh, the, the regulations you're referring to wouldn't restrict by their terms someone from theoretically getting uh, that ID. I, I have a uh, sort of a question related to what we were talking about before. It seems like it would be impossible for me to prove to you that voter fraud is not a problem. Because what you said before was, well, voter fraud by its nature is meant Dude, to be like so, avoiding like, the idea that the voter fraud, nobody ever commits voter fraud, blah, 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 blah. How naive, how naive do you have to be that there's never been anybody that tried to stuff I, the ballot box? There's a long history and tradition uh, all across the world of stuffing the ballot box and voter fraud. And that's ridiculous. How do I prove like, it's oh, not my a problem in the oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. The Democrat Party are they're they're angels. They're angels. There was there's no corruption in the United States. There's no wrongdoing in the United States. Get Wait, but what's out your of what, here. What, I mean, that's what, preposterous. I, I I totally I totally respect that. That that's it is the case that there have been. I mean, just look at um, I'm not now remember, not remembering the countries of Belarus, where the with the voter fraud that happened recently. Um, my question is, how can I prove to you? Is there enough data somewhere that exists that could prove to you that voter fraud is not a problem in the United States? What kind of data would convince you? It, se it seems like I can never convince you that voter fraud is not actually a problem in the United States. There's I'm no not, amount I'm of not data. Look, I'm not looking for data to prove that voter fraud is not a, not a problem. The, the fact of the matter is, is that when you have a system where it's possible and it's possible to do it without getting caught, 
you need to change the system to secure the election. That that's what I'm talking about. Like even if even if even if it was a hundred percent true fact that oh nobody ever commits voter nobody ever does crime. Crime doesn't happen. Nobody commits crimes. We're all angels. The Democrat Party's not corrupt. No, no, no. There's no crime. There's nothing bad ever happens. Even if that was true, that doesn't change the fact that you ought to have um Laws to prevent laws it in the place future. to prevent because it's OK, maybe maybe it's maybe it's true that the modern Democrats this year, they're all angels and, and nobody ever commits crimes and nobody ever does anything wrong. And it's all perfect. Maybe that's true this year. It's not necessarily true next year. I, I understand where you get to that position, because I think in your mind, these regulations are costless because they're not actually preventing anyone from voting. Um, and so they're always justifiable because since they're not preventing anyone from voting, uh, why not have them? They're just an, a free extra security measure. But um, if it were the case that these measures weren't costless and that they were burdening some people to vote, I think your, your perspective might be different. Imagine that I, in my town, uh, we don't have any problem with graffiti usage. No problem whatsoever with graffiti usage. And someone were to tell you, we really, really, really need to get a, a graffiti enforcement unit in our police and we need to spend... $10 billion on it. You would say that's not happening because it's not a problem. So we shouldn't spend money to regulate something that isn't happening in our state. I think that's a, entirely the same rationale here. Um, I think that these regulations are costly for certain types of voters. And because there doesn't seem to be a big problem um, in the past, we can argue on the merits of both those things, whether or not there's been a problem in the past and whether or not it burdens voters. But given where we are on those issues, I think I can reasonably say that there doesn't seem to be much, much use of the laws because it burdens some people and it doesn't add much to our security since it's not a big problem anyway. What's wrong with that rationale, accepting as premises uh, that it's costly and that um, there's not a lot of voter fraud to begin with? If I accept those premises, my conclusion is sound, right? I mean, that that's you can have that belief that's a it's a political question about whether it's worth it to spend the money to do this or if blah 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 i i think it it doesn't hold up to logic it doesn't hold up to history it doesn't hold up to anything but you can have that you can you can believe you okay. can believe that nobody ever commits crimes all you want you can believe you know that oh it's it's expensive to do this all i want you can believe that some people don't have ids all you want i mean it doesn't i don't think that's i don't think it's rational i don't think it's true um, uh, but that's you're perfectly well within your right to to ha have that political position, and that's what this is about. I mean, these are political okay. questions we're talking about. You disagree with me politically, okay? Well, I, I think I just we also disagree on the facts. I mean, because because I think you think that the the regulations don't burden people's votes, and you think that voter fraud might be a big problem in the past and might be a big problem in the future, correct? Or or maybe it's a little stronger than that. It is a problem right now. The, no, the the issue the issue is is that it's more likely to happen right now when you have a system okay. in place where you don't have security measures, it makes it much more likely that it's going to happen, and it makes it much more likely that when it does happen, you don't catch them. And so it's okay. about it's about the opportunities and it's about the incentives. And uh, there's certainly lots of evidence of of shenanigans that have that have gone on, and there's a long history all across the world, all across the world in multiple countries for hundreds of years of stuffing the ballot box and voter fraud. And this idea that there's no such thing as election fraud is preposterous, in my opinion. I mean, people are okay. not angels. Crime, crimes do happen. There are there are criminals out there and there is corruption and, and some people are corrupt and some people commit crimes. And the idea that there's no corruption and there's no crimes ever, I think, is just not true. OK, um, before I leave, you because I know you're you're uh, you're getting tired. Uh, um, like I saw in the chat, not that I, this is a tiring conversation. Uh, I really, I really appreciate being on and talking to you. I, I hope we can do it again sometime. Um, I had a question with one last statement that Trump made on November 4th in the early wee mornings of the election. Trump declared victory. Do you condemn him for declaring victory at that time? No, people can can't claim victory all they want. Uh, do you think that, that it was a responsible statement to make? In 2016, when Trump claimed victory? No, no, no. Sorry, 2020. In 2020. Oh, wait, hold on. Yeah. 
When did Trump claim victory in 2020? Frankly, we did win this election. Oh, it, like at 2 a.m. or something? Yeah. Well, votes were still being, uh, were still being counted in many key states. <laughs> Well, I mean, that, that's no different than what the media does with their, oh, well, there's 80, 80% 80 of the ballots are in and Trump is leading by 700,000 votes. And so we're going to call it. So but the media didn't do that. The media the did media that did. all night long for Joe Biden states. And then they re, they didn't do it on any Trump states. So, well, I'm not analyzing the no, media, I mean, though, right? I, it, like, it was irresponsible, right? You wouldn't have done it if it were you, right? No, it's it's not irresponsible. There's no there's no damage to anybody for Trump to say I won when he's leading in every state and there's 80% of the ballots counted. What about afterwards now where he's claimed multiple times that he has won the election when those claims haven't been sort of Okay, we're going winning. back we're going back. Okay. I've answered that a million times because uh I've explained that there's bigger issues at play here. Okay. In terms of trying to show that we have an insecure system and getting the system changed, but also Trump has every right to make his claims and get it, get his day in court. And for you okay. to sit for you to sit here and say it's irresponsible for Trump to make a, a a legal claim and 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 try to shame somebody out of having their day in court. Everybody has I don't a right think to I'm a day that. in court, and and you, and, it, and you should be ashamed of yourself for trying to, to for trying to claim it's irresponsible for somebody to to want to have their day in court. I, I don't think that those are related. I can say that Trump can have his day in court. No, you just got done. You just got done trying trying to ridicule and shame and, and try to say it's irresponsible to, to, for him I, to I want to have his day in court. Well, well, they're not the same thing, right? So, so saying that you can have your day in court is not the same thing as claiming that you've affirmatively won the election. Those are two different actions. And I think that, that one is totally fine, but claiming an election... When I, mean, I, I would understand if you said like it's disputed, I might have won is different than saying I won, and I think that maybe that's a distinction that doesn't matter to you. And he's just being um, a vigorous advocate of his position, um, but I think that people are hearing him and people are influenced by what well, he's saying. I, I think I think when you have as much evidence of shenanigans as that as we have here. That it's perfectly. I think. I think what Trump is doing may go down as one of the greatest, most responsible things to ever happen in, to America. And if 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 it turns out that what Trump is doing and what Trump is claiming here finally makes the American people realize that all of these voting changes that Democrats have put in place for the last forty years have destroyed our election processes, then then what Trump is doing here may go down as one of the greatest things that anybody okay. has ever done for America. And it's extremely responsible and in fact he probably even has an obligation to do it <laughs> lecture fan thank you so much for having me on it was a pleasure talking to you yeah uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime uh Good times. really enjoyed your content and uh and yeah thanks again for having me and thank you chat <laughs> yeah thank you man good chatting have a good yep bye-bye see ya